Good morning, Internet. Lizard here. We're looking at my fantasy world made in QGIS. If you look to your left on the legend, you can see all of these various fields have been uh, numbered and itemized. I think that this has a really good utility for creating world building indexes. If you look at this attribute table, this program just keeps track of all of these details and where they are in my world. It's great for playing Dungeons and Dragons, it's great for world building, and I'm going to show you how I built this. I hope you enjoy. So we're in MS Paint. This is what I've used to create most of my maps. Initially, I wanted to use one of the many map making programs that are out there. However, I found that those tailored to fantasy didn't really give me the level of scaling or fields that I wanted, and if I was going to use a new program, and it wasn't going to give me all that, I, I was just going to make a map and paint. I used to doodle a lot in this program when I was 12, and I figured it was a pretty comfortable place to get started. I also hate myself. If you go over here to my legend, you can see I've got all of the towns, the populations in all of the towns, the points of interest, the empire that all of this belongs to, the underlying ground cover, and how much space everything takes up. And one of the most important things to keep in mind is your scale. So if you looked earlier, I had two pixels equals one imperial league. One Imperial League is the exact same as one mile, so if we take this line drawing tool, we can see that this is about 3,000 pixels long at the line, meaning the continent itself is about 1,500 miles across at its widest point. So all of these continents have the same scale on them. All of these continents are created for various different campaign settings, all within the same kind of world framework. And so all of these continents with the same scale needing to go on a world map would need a really, really large world map, because again, two pixels per mile, worlds are, well, I mean, our planet's circumference is like... Right, so with Earth's circumference being that large, and me wanting to model an Earth-sized world on a two pixels per mile scale, I would need an image on the order of probably 50,000 by 20,000 pixels. Now, that is a very tall order for the likes of MS Paint, such that it will not even process it, and it'll just kind of stop responding when you try to make something that big. I grew up, I graduated, I started using GIMP, a real image editing program that allowed me to make a 23,000 by 10,750 pixel image. Now this is the equivalent to about a hemisphere. As you can see on Google Earth, I have drawn a line of about 11,000 miles, meaning my Earth-sized planet either needs to use a different scale for its maps than the one I designed all the continents for, or be double the density and half the size. That way, the gravity would stay the same. I didn't like either of these options, so I decided to do something different. And now we're in G-plates. G-Plates is tectonic plate modeling software used by geologists to model the progression of a tectonic plate from a point on Earth across millions and millions of years. The scientists that use this will then render an animation of the plate's progress and show it to the scientific community. However, that's not what we're going to be using G-Plates for. You're going to go over to File, Import, import roster. So if you look at the file formats, any image-based map you have should be one of these. If it's not, you can easily save it as one of those and throw it into G-Plates. It's going to take a second to load up, but when it does, you should have your image in all of its high-resolution glory. So I originally got this idea from the YouTuber Artifexian. He uses G-Plates to make a video demonstrating how tectonic plates work. He just draws polygons on the globe and shows you how to do it, and I thought to myself, well golly, if I've got this image that I can just wrap around this globe using software, then I can also trace my continents, mark my cities, and even draw kingdoms, all on top of the initial image. So I have successfully converted my world from a roster image into a series of vector-based points, lines, and polygons. Turning a hemisphere into a globe is messy business, and my scale seemed to bear the brunt of that. If we remember measuring a distance on this continent from its longest point was around 1500 miles. This is more on the order of... Yeah, G-Plates doesn't use Imperial, hold up almost 4,000 miles. And while G-Plates is technically geographic information software, it's rather limited in the attributes it allows you to attach to your points. So in order to make full use of the points, lines, and polygons we've just placed, we're gonna go over to Manage Feature Collections under the File tab. And over here we see the current file type that G-Plates uses. It's the G-Plates markup language, GPML. That is not very useful outside of G-Plates. So what we need to do is we need to take the layer that we've traced all of our continents in, and we need to save a copy. 
copy of it. In this little drop-down file under Save as Type, you're going to hit as Reshape File. That will allow the GPML files to be read in other types of GIS softwares that aren't just G-plates. The utility of this being all of the polygons we have just placed uh, sync up to actual latitude and longitude coordinates on the simulated globe. So we put that data into another GIS program and we have the same result and spread of continents on the same scale at the same distance in a new program. Right, so now we're in QGIS. I hope this uh, layout of continents is starting to look somewhat familiar at this point. I've got my legend and my index of symbols over here, and I'm just going to go through it. So first I added cities. Now every city in the attribute table has its name, the 60% of the racial composition, 30% of the racial composition, and 10% of the racial composition as well as exports at 30, 60, and 10, um, the empire that the city belongs to, and its population. So what connects cities but the roads? Now the roads have been indexed according to their danger. So as you can see, um, roads around a lot of cities and a lot of people aren't as dangerous as roads that go through isolated mountain ranges, forests, or the desert. This mechanic works largely in part to create a pseudo-random form of encounters where players realize they will be walking on a dangerous road and then the danger rating assigned to the road just kind of works as a modifier to the probability of encounter. Now we've got the farmland. The farmland is rated on a fertility index from 1 to 8. I believe 8 is the most fertile land, meaning that 80% of the allotted field is farmable. I don't know how accurate that is, but I don't want it to be 100% ever. We've got greener pastures in this area closer to 8, and we've got less green pastures in this area closer to 3, so obviously food would probably be cheaper and more easily available here in the north than it would be here in the south due to the worst farmland. Um, the forests are rated on danger, however the symbols I use are not very good at indicating the change in color, so you're just gonna have to look at my attribute table and believe me, the danger level works the same as it does on the roads, just increases the chance of an encounter. Marshes also with a danger level, um, same situation, increases the likelihood of encounters in more dangerous areas, and if it doesn't increase likelihood, then at least have it increase difficulty. We've got our lakes, which I'm just gonna skip for now. Barren plains, if it's just kind of empty land that's not good at farming, I, I wouldn't make it grassland because there'd probably be environmental factors that would have changed the underlying ecology. So the desert is a desert and it's over here. It's, uh, there's really only one at the moment. And then mountain ranges, which I assume it's a given that they're difficult to pass or traverse, so therefore the only field they have assigned to them is merely the name. Rivers are drawn based on how much water flows through them is how thick they are. So we can go to the attribute table and we can see the flow rating. I tried to have the number of streams, runs, creeks, and smaller waterways add up to equal the rating of flow for the river that they all feed into that leads to the sea, but ultimately this was just a device I used to get the program to draw lines at varying thicknesses. I'm not a hydrogeologist, I'm not a hydro uh, uh, like systems engineer, I don't care, it is what it is, and I appreciate it for that. This is also handy because it allows you to render complete maps for your players to view in the game, or just for you as a world builder to display various parts of your world in a framework that people can easily understand. So you go over to Project, New Print Layout, but I've already got my layouts and you can save them, so I'm just going to show you one of mine. This is the island of Arasaka. It is a map I made in order to inform people of the island whenever they play on it. You've got your scale bar, you've got all of your legends necessary for all of the things on the map, and you've got a nice title and a north arrow. This is just basically a map making program within a map making program, and it allows you to render maps at any scale using any amount of legend items from anywhere in your world. It's extremely handy. And on top of all that, I think that this just provides a wonderful way for world builders to keep all of their items organized and cataloged, as well as select them. This is this is the coolest part. If you can select all of your points with attributes, and you can go over to your attribute table, and there they are. And if I zoom in, you can see they have turned yellow on the map. You do the same thing to water systems, roadways, whether you want to use it to play D&D or just make your own fantasy world, I think that this has been the most useful world building tool I've found thus far. And I suppose this affords any aspiring writer, uh, world builder, dungeon master to 
be able to have world politics that are logistically consistent, because you're not... Like, this program doesn't forget details, it won't leave things out, it's just up to you to parse through it after you've created it to make sure everything is consistent. There's a lot of fun tips and tricks about this that I'd be willing to share, I'm just trying to keep the video kind of short so it's approachable. If you liked what I had to share, um, please let me know what you thought, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, I'd be more than welcome to answer them, but otherwise, have a nice evening, internet, thank you for watching.